So um, carpal tunnel is is a condition that is ex extremely common. It's it's uh, it's one of the most common orthopedic conditions in the UK. We we see over a million cases of people with carpal tunnel in the UK per year. And for, for many people, to be fair, we don't actually know what, what causes it. So for um, a lot of people that I see, I cannot put my finger on why that person has, has got carpal tunnel. It's just very, very common. And for many people, it just it is one of those things that, 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 that somebody will get carpal tunnel syndrome and we won't know why they've got it. But there is no doubt that there are some conditions and some occupations that are potentially um, associated with it. Carpal tunnel is caused by pressure on the nerve at the front of the wrist. So in theory, any occupation that causes uh, uh, repeated pressure on that area can cause somebody to have carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a lot of debate in the scientific literature about which occupations are mo more likely to get carpal tunnel syndrome. But there's no doubt, I think, that if you use vibrating machinery or vibrate, vibrating tools, you're more likely to get carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a, a lot of debate about other specialties, but I think it'd be reasonable to expect any occupation that puts repeated pressure on that area to potentially put somebody at risk of carpal tunnel. Now, it may be that those people were already had a predisposition, already had the possibility that they might have got carpal tunnel because of what they do. It, it's, it has exacerbated the fact that they've gone on to get it. But, so potentially some occupations, but a, a lot of debate about that. Um, there is also the possibility that people's an anatomy, the, the way that their hands are built can predispose them to carpal tunnel. So if you're naturally somebody with a small carpal tunnel, a small area where the, the nerve is coming into the hand, maybe you're more likely to get carpal tunnel tunnel syndrome and therefore there may be a group of people that because of the way that they are have more of a likelihood to get carpal tunnel so there may be a genetic predisposition it may be that you have several members of your family who've had a, a, a carpal tunnel or it may just be that it's so common that it just happens that lots of you have it without it being a, a genetic link as again there's a quite a lot of debate about that that there's no doubt though that there are certain conditions that we do see carpal tunnel in more so than, than in people who don't have those conditions. And the, the common ones are diabetes. That's very high on the list because diabetes is actually quite a common condition now and diabetes is often associated with damage to, to nerves. And if you're diabetic, you're more likely to get carpal tunnel syndrome. You're also more likely to get carpal tunnel syndrome if you have rheumatoid arthritis or any condition that causes swelling around your tendons and your joints, because the carpal tunnel is a tight space. The, the, the median nerve comes into the hand with nine tendons that move your fingers. The tendons don't get affected by pressure, but the median nerve does. So anything that causes swelling around those tendons or around the joints in the wrist and puts pressure on the carpal tunnel, will put you more at risk of getting carpal tunnel syndrome. And rheumatoid arthritis is one of those conditions. There is also no doubt that if you are obese, if you have more tissue, if you have more fat in your body, you are more likely to get carpal tunnel syndrome. So we are seeing a, 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 a much obesity in the general population and, and obesity, there is no doubt, has an association with developing carpal tunnel syndrome as do some other conditions such as uh, an underactive thyroid gland. And it's potentially conditions like a, that which, which cause the, 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 the swellings in part of your body, different areas of fluid retention that can, can, can be associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. And, and one other condition that is transient, but is associated with changes in, in fluid uh, distribution is pregnancy. And there's no doubt that pregnancy uh, means that uh, women are more likely to get carpal tunnel syndrome. The fact about pregnancy and carpal tunnel syndrome is, as I say, it's a transient condition. And generally, if you're able to manage the, 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 the symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome during pregnancy, those symptoms will get better when you're no longer pregnant. And there's also some evidence that in, in women, the menopause potentially can, can cause some, some increased risk of, of carpal tunnel syndrome. And then there are conditions which are um, which can happen to you, such as trauma that can alter the, the anatomy of the carpal tunnel and can make it more likely that there's pressure on the nerve. And the most common conditions around the, the, the wrist are 
uh, fractures. So if you have a fractured wrist that alters the shape of the carpal tunnel and potentially causes swelling into the carpal tunnel, um, you can, you're more likely to get carpal tunnel. So I mean, as, as uh, is the case with anything that causes a mass to, to, to encroach on the carpal tunnel. So you can get lipomas, relatively rare in the hand and wrist, that, but can, can cause pressure on the carpal tunnel, or ganglion cysts, fluid collections that go into the carpal tunnel and cause median nerve um, symptoms. But generally, we don't know what causes it, although we can certainly, we have, a, as you can see, there's a fairly long list of, of conditions that are associated with it. But for most part, for the, most of the people I see, I do not, I, I can't tell them why they've got carpal tunnel syndrome. But there is, a, it's a small subgroup of people where it's important to rule out other conditions. And in the UK, often the GPs will, 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 will be the best people at doing that in terms of picking out whether, you know, somebody might have diabetes, that they haven't been diagnosed with diabetes or might have an underactive thyroid. So there are potentially some blood tests that need to be done in people with carpal tunnel syndrome when there may possibly be a cause for it. But for the most part, it's a, it's a condition that we really don't know why this person has got it and that person has So as I've already mentioned, it's a very common condition and you can really get it at any age. I, I see it in, in every age group apart from children. It's, it's very rare in children, but as soon as you reach adolescence and late teens, early twenties, you can get carpal tunnel syndrome. It, um, it is more common in, in middle age in sort of 30, 40 to, to, to 60 year olds. Uh, so generally in that age group, but, but anyone can get it. So um, I think it's easier to talk about the, the, the symptoms first because they're, they're more straightforward. Um, and the, the symptoms that people get with carpal tunnel syndrome are due to the fact that the nerve is not working normally. And the nerve, uh, the nerves in, in very simplistic terms are involved with two uh, functions. They, they transmit sensations sensation from the, the hand to the brain. They're, they're, the, they're the instrument that enables you to sense touch and, and have sensation of pain, temperature, and, and, and uh, all those things that, that deliver messages to, to the brain. But they also deliver messages from the brain to the hand in terms of movement. So in terms of sensation, when you have pressure on the, on the median nerve in the wrist, when you have carpal tunnel syndrome, your sensation is affected. And, and in, in, in the, the earlier forms of, of carpal tunnel, the, the more mild forms, you could get the sensation of tingling or pins and needles. It's, it's more or less the, 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 the same thing in terms of what people are describing, but it, it's that sensation that there, there's this, that, that there is um, uh, pins and needles in your fingertips and your thumb. And importantly, the, the, the median nerve does not supply the whole of the hand. So often people will, will, will feel, will have the sensation it's only on the, on the thumb side of the hand that they have those strange feelings. And typically the median nerve supplies the thumb, the index and the middle finger, and, and classically half of the ring finger. It's rare that people will tell you that precisely. And it's not the same in everybody because in, in some people in, it, it doesn't, uh, 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 provides sensation from the ring finger at all, and some people it provides um, sensation to the whole of the ring finger. But to, it, there's no doubt that some patients will notice that the little finger is not usually affected. That's not always the case, and it doesn't exclude somebody having carpal tunnel syndrome if they tell you that they think that the little finger is, is involved, because everybody's different. But sometimes the patients will notice that the little finger is not involved. So the sensation will be affected. And generally that starts as pink, the tingling as pins and needles. As the, the condition progresses and as the nerve starts to get damaged, it, the, the, it, it's no longer pins and needles and tingling that you get, it's, it's numbness. You, you can't feel or you, you don't feel as much as, as you used to be able to. So you, you notice that when you touch things, you're not getting the normal feedback. If you're not looking at your buttons, for example, when you're trying to do them up, you can't do it because you don't have the normal sensation. And that's a, a little bit concerning in terms of um, the fact that that is, is a warning sign that, that, is ner that the nerve is starting to get damaged and, and we need to do something about it because numbness is, is, is potentially not reversible but pins and needles tingling are reversible. So 
that, that is, it, it, they, they're both, they, they all reflect different variations in terms of the sensation, but one is more serious than the other. So that's um, sensation. And people may find that they get those symptoms, very typically uh, the people get those symptoms when they're driving, anything which tends to hold the hand in a slightly raised position for a longer period of time. So driving is very typical that patients will say that they, they notice that they get these sensory symptoms when they're driving. Holding a phone, we're all used to using phones uh, a lot more these days than we used to. And, and um, um, when you're on the phone for a while, you might notice you start to get the tingling pins and needles. Holding a book, holding a newspaper, very typical things that people tell me are the, are the, the things that will bring on the, the symptoms. And as I've already alluded to, if your sensation is affected, particularly if you've got numbness, you'll have difficulty doing fine things when you're not looking at your hand, such as doing up buttons. Another side of, of sensation is pain. And uh, patients with carpal tunnel syndrome will often get pain, and it's very, very typically at night. Patients will often wake up with pain in their hands. It, it's usually associated with a degree of sensory loss, so they'll usually notice that they have pins and needles or tingling, but it's pain which wakes them up. Uh, and again, they may notice that the little finger is not affected, but it's a very, very typical symptom of carpal tunnel syndrome, and it can be an incredibly disabling symptom. I, I, I see patients that haven't had a good night's sleep for weeks or months because of a carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and, and this is a very typical presentation, um, but that's another aspect of the, the sensory thing. And, and people find that they, they have to get out of bed, they have to shake their hands, lots of different ways that people find uh, how to deal with it. But, really quite an obtrusive symptom. The other side of, of nerve function is, is delivering messages from your brain to your muscles. Um, and actually the median nerve in the hand supplies very small number of, of the muscles within the, 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 the palm. And it's mainly the muscles to the base of the thumb. So patients may notice that they've got a little bit of difficulty using their thumb, a little bit of weakness. That tends to be a slightly later uh, symptom of, of carpal tunnel. And, and unfortunately, like the numbness, it, it quite often is associated with, with loss of muscle um, uh, bulk, because that's what happens when a nerve is not delivering normal messages to, 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 the, to the muscle. But that's effectively the, 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 the spectrum of symptoms that people have. In terms of signs, it, 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 it's not always very straightforward uh, that somebody has carpal tunnel syndrome when you're examining them. The history is key. And, and often, but once I've spoken to the patient and they've given me the history and we've gone through the, their signs, I will pretty much know that they've got carpal tunnel syndrome because it, it, it presents in a very typical way. So the signs will help me, but they won't be what makes the difference in terms of me knowing whether they've got carpal tunnel syndrome or not. But in terms of, of signs, if you've got established numbness in your hand, that is relatively easy to detect and to, to um, be, be certain to, to quite a significant level of probability that it's in the median nerve territory. So you can test the sensation in, in people's hands just by, in the most simplistic ways, by asking them to, to close their eyes and comparing the way that the, 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 the um, stroking uh, is felt on the different uh, sides. Um, but there are some more sophisticated tests in terms of how well you feel um, uh, filaments being touched on your uh, finger and how well you dif differentiate two separate points of contact on your finger. But generally, you can only pick that up if somebody has got established numbness. Um, tingling or, or, or pins and needles is not something that you can usually um, uh, detect by clinical examination. Um, so quite often the patients won't have a test, it, it, it won't have any signs when they're sitting in front of you but you can do provocative tests on them, which can um, it bring on the symptoms of, of carpal tunnel syndrome. So what we're trying to do is trying to reproduce the things that, that they would be doing that, that make them get the carpal tunnel symptoms. Um, in very simplistic terms, uh, when you're tapping over the median nerve at the wrist, sometimes people will get an electric shock sensation. That's not a particularly good test because people without carpal tunnel syndrome can have that sensation and people with carpal tunnel syndrome don't always get that sensation but 
classically we're told that it's something that, that is, is, um, is worth doing. Um, more, more sensitive in, 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 is to try and put the hand into a position where the, we know that there is greater uh, pressure on, on the median nerve and see if that reproduces the symptoms. Typically, um, this is the sort of position that we, it, historically um, people have looked at. And if you wait for long enough, quite often on the hand that has carpal tunnel syndrome, the patient will tell you that they're starting to develop pins and needles and things. And then there's lots of modifications on that where you can put direct pressure on that uh, hand, either in the straight position or in the bent position. But these are provocative tests. But I base my diagnosis very much more strongly on the on the history than on the examination because I know that examination is, is not always as helpful as as the history um, because the history often tells tells you the answer. Well, luckily treatment is available and um, it's, it's one of the reasons that I have the job that I have is because I treat this condition uh, very commonly. It is, it is the, the most common uh, condition that I see in, in my patients because it is a very common condition in, in the general population. In terms of the treatment, I think we have to, to, to uh, uh, grade the, the treatment according to the grade of carpal tunnel syndrome that the patient presents with. Because if the symptoms are very mild, then there are things which are very simple to do, which may make the difference and we may not need to consider anything else. So in patients that are just getting the typical night pain and that are getting very little in the way of symptoms during the day, they may find that by using a splint at night, that will help to settle their symptoms. The, the reasoning being, if you can hold the hand in a position where when you're asleep, there is less pressure on that nerve, it will give you less symptoms, less likely to wake you up at night and hopefully resolve uh, the, 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 the carpal tunnel syndrome. So what you want to be doing is you want to hold a splint which has a rigid bar on, so it holds your, your wrist straight. Now, if you uh, get a, a splint over the counter with, with a metal bar. It's very easy. Any, any chemist in the UK will, will provide you with one. But you'll notice that those splints are made to be used during the day. And generally, when you're using your hand during the day, your, hand, your, your wrist is bent slightly backwards. So um, that the wrist, the, the metal bar in the splint will be in this position. Now, we, we've no, we know from some fairly good anatomical studies that if your wrist is actually held straight in this position, that is the position where in which there is the least pressure on your nerve. So what I always advise to patients, and if I am the one to supply them with a splint, I will do this myself, but it's, it's relatively straightforward for the patient to do this if they're the ones buying the splint, is to straighten that metal bar. So you want the, the wrist splint completely straight, and that is your night splint. It, it's, it's, it's a splint which you use at night. If you want to use a, a splint during the day for whatever reason, it's best to, to have the traditional splint with the, with the wrist bent slightly backwards because that helps in terms of your function. But at night, you want your wrist straight. And for many people, that will be enough in terms of settling their symptoms at night and settling their symptoms overall in, in terms of their carpal tunnel syndrome. So that's the, the milder forms. And in milder forms, you may also find that taking simple painkillers or anti-inflammatory medication, you can control the, the symptoms and, and the carpal tunnel syndrome will, will settle down. Uh, that medication doesn't tend to, but it will uh, treat your, your symptoms, your pain, and quite often it's a, it's a condition that will settle down anyway. So it just helps, you get, it helps to get you through that. Um, in, in terms of um, for treatments for uh, more, more severe cause as well. We're then getting into the patients that are getting more daytime symptoms, more pins and needles, more tingling when they're using their hands during the day. And the first thing to look at is if there's something that you can pinpoint makes, brings on your symptoms, then clearly, logically, if it's possible for you to avoid those activities, then that's what we, where we should start. And for a lot of people that involves work, and, and their work environment. So if you're, if you're somebody that works at a, at, a, at a desk and you notice that you get your carpal tunnel symptoms, for example, when you're using a mouse, 
then most occupational health departments associated to your work or, or should be able to advise you about better ergonomics at work. And, and there are uh, 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 wrist supports that hold your wrist in better position when you're using a keyboard. So there's not that much bend on the wrist. And there are even special uh, uh, mice, mouses, um, that enable your hand to use the mouse in a slightly different position that in theory will put less pressure on your nerve. So if you may find that by modifying your activities or by mo modifying your work environment, you're able to control the symptoms. People generally come to me once they've already tried those simple measures and they, they need something else done. If we're still at the stage where you're getting pins and needles, where you're getting tingling, um, it, 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 it may be possible and it may be the right thing to consider an injection into the carpal tunnel. The, the, um, the reason for, for considering an injection and the reason why it is effective is what we're putting into the carpal tunnel is a strong anti-inflammatory. It is, it is a steroid, but it's a steroid that just acts locally and it, it reduces inflammation, but it reduces swelling generally. That's how it functions. So it makes sense that by introducing a, a, a steroid injection into the carpal tunnel and reducing the swelling, you, you're reducing the amount of pressure on the nerve and you're therefore going to help carpal tunnel syndrome. And I always consider an injection if the symptoms are relatively moderate because the injection can be curative. The injection may be all that you need. Um, and in some cases, when the injection works for a long time and the symptoms come back, it's even worth considering a second injection because that may be what you need in terms of setting your symptoms. So I always consider an injection and it also in, in many cases confirms that that's the diagnosis, but generally I use it hopefully as a treatment method, hoping that we won't need to do anything else. Surgery is, is the other treatment option and that is reserved only for those patients in which they've either had a carpal tunnel injection and their symptoms have come back, or they've had repeated injections and we're really not getting anywhere with those, or for whatever reason, they don't want an injection, or, and this is important, in cases where we feel that there is already some damage to the nerve and that the, 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 the signs are potentially pointing to the fact that if we don't get that pressure off the nerve, it, that nerve may not recover. So, and that generally tends to be numbness and muscle wasting. So when in those sort of later, more severe cases of carpal tunnel syndrome, I, I, I prefer to, to talk about an operation instead of an injection because we don't wanna lose any time in terms of taking that pressure off the nerve because potentially in those cases, we're already, in a situation where even if we take the pressure off the nerve and we know we've done it on, in a reliable way with an operation, the, the, the nerve may not recover. 